Hi there. My name is Susan McPherson. I'm the founder and CEO of McPherson Strategies and a proud member of Reboot, the arts and cultural nonprofit organization that reimagines and reinforces Jewish thought and traditions. The program you're about to see was produced for Jewish American Heritage Month in collaboration with the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History and JMUSE as part of our Reboot Ideas conversation series, which hosts critical dialogues that evolve the Jewish experience and transform our society. Never forget the American Jewish response to the refugee crisis features an esteemed panel of some of my dear friends and colleagues. Juliet Simmons, the creator of What Would You Bring Project, Anne Marie Gray, the executive director and CEO for USA for UNHCR, and Sloan Davidson, founder and CEO of Hello Neighbor. Moderated by Reboot Studios Managing Director, Noam Dromi, the group will explore ways in which the American Jewish community has taken an active role in refugee resettlement and support services and the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead. Before we begin this great panel, it's my pleasure to introduce the award-winning animated short film, Aurora and the Teacups, produced by Juliet and Noam and directed and animated by UK art artist, Jacqueline Nichols. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hello, my name is Aurora Zinder. I'm 80 years old. I left Odessa in 1978 at age of 38 because of anti-Semitic atmosphere in all country that was supported by our government. Jews were one third of the city through almost all its history, and we were always outsiders. So you didn't feel that government accept you. They are always implying that Jews were not good citizens. It was painful to leave Russia. Every person is attached to place. They were born and live and have friends and family especially. That was really a horrible time. The worst part was going through custom in Russia before we left. People who were there, they were kind of hostile. And we left, it was my mom, and it was my husband's grandmother. She was 89 years old, and my son. When we left, we were allowed to take our personal things with us, but it was certain rules that could change from month to month. Me and my husband, we love books. We couldn't take books that was published before uh, 1946. So I had to leave. My favorite books was a work of Pushkin, published in 1946. They opened everything. It was terrible things. I kept a lot of buttons. They took two buttons and said that, oh, it looked like diamond. Handwriting was not allowed to bring. So my father's letters from the front didn't pass customs. It's crazy. Uh, my father was killed in 1942 at front. He had three brothers who, all of, all of them were fighting in the army. They survived. And youngest brother, my mom knew him better, so we met him a few times after the war. And one time he gave me this cup and saucer, bigger one, and he made this inscription, and he said from my uncle Volodya, actually it's only almost one piece that connected with my father. My mom had four brothers and sister. She was the youngest one. Her brother married before revolution to young girl with family they used to be very rich. And I spent with this family, with my uncle, almost every year, months or few weeks, whatever, we were very close. And she had six plates. And of course, I, uh, I like it very much. But later on, when I became interested in Japanese art, I paid more attention. When my aunt died, my uncle 
sent to me this one plate and I was able to bring it to America with me because it's memory of my aunt and my uncle. This piece is very dear to me. It reminds me of my childhood about my aunt who was very nice and kind person, very good cook. It belonged to my family. This belonged to younger sister of my grandmother, my grand aunt. She ran from European part of Russia during revolution. It was pogrom revolution. It was terrible time. Her husband was probably well enough and they were able to run to Ural Mountains and they lived there. When war started, we left Odessa and we stayed there for four years. I remember her very well and that belongs to her. And she gave to my mom later on because she knew that I like China. I couldn't bring it with us during immigration. They were not allowed. We came to America in 78. New York was not the kindest city in the world, but it was a good city. People were kind, understand our position, and everyone was helped by someone who were Americans already. I was fine job this way. Majority of my friends find job. Somebody was willing to help them to get a job. 79, I find jobs that I worked for 10 years. And it's very strange. It was one girl, her name was Lisa, and her parents were from Poland. She came here to America and she knew Russian. And she visited Russia many times. I didn't know her well, but a few months later, she came to me and said, you know, I'm going to Odessa. Would you like me to see anyone in Odessa? I said, yes, I have my mother-in-law. So I gave her very small um, you know, present for my mother-in-law. And she came, she knocked to the door. It was almost a little bit more than one year uh, since our immigration. And this girl speaks Russian. And she says that I came from your daughter-in-law and her son too, and her grandson. Of course, it was very big emotional situation. And before she left, she gave to her. She said, bring to her. I knew, I know she loved it. This is fragile things. And given, you know, my life experience, I know what people do when they have to move from apartment to apartment. All my family all over in America and in Israel know where it's located. I have my own collection. If they want to know, they may come and see, enjoy this. Uh, this cups and everything, it's very good, very important, but I have connection to them. They remind me of my family, other generation, maybe yes, maybe not. It belongs to history, not to family. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Noam Dromi. I am the Managing Director of Reboot Studios. I am joined today by my colleague, Juliet Simmons, the creator of the What Would You Bring Storytelling Initiative. It's our great pleasure to be speaking with Anne-Marie Gray, the Executive Director and CEO of USA for UNHCR, and Sloan Davidson, Founder and CEO of Hello Neighbor. Hello, ladies. How is everyone? Great. Thank you. <laughs> thank Excellent. You. Uh, we've just seen a really powerful film about Ukrainian refugee Aurora Zinder, who escaped anti-Semitism and persecution in the Soviet Union during the 70s and made it successfully to the United States, where she was able to integrate into American society, find work and build a community through the assistance of refugee resettlement organizations. And it is a great pleasure to be speaking today with two very prominent figures in the discussion of refugees for a perspective of what is going on with regard to recent refugee situations at the time of this recording, including the situation in Ukraine, the ongoing situation in Afghanistan, and the broader discussion about all of the places perhaps that do not get the kind of media and news coverage that some of the more recent ones have been receiving. Um, Juliet, 
I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what inspired the creation of the film that we just saw about Aurora. And then we will transition that into the discussion about the work that both Sloan and Anne-Marie have been doing. I, um, I was inspired to create the What Would You Bring project because my family um, has refugee history. So my grandparents, my great grandparents were refugees. And um, I often think that if it hadn't been for people helping them, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be living the life that I'm living. And before COVID, I volunteered at the Centre for Refugees and Asylum Seekers in London. And I would often sit and chat with them and have a cup of tea with them. And I was interested to know what was important to them and what they brought with them and why they wanted to leave or why they felt they had to leave their homes and what they felt they wanted to get from their new homes. And the opportunity arose for me to come to New York with Reboot and be part of a Reboot Fellowship and explore the archives at YIVO. Um, and in the archives at YIVO, I wanted to see what people brought with them. And I thought that I would be reading documents and reading people's testimonies. And when I got there, I was presented with boxes and inside the boxes were the actual things that people brought with them. And there were teddy bears and there were teacups. Um, there was jewelry made from pasta, there were books, there were socks. And I just thought about how those things were so similar to the things that the people who I sat down with in London and had tea with told me that they brought with them. They were things that reminded them of home and reminded them of um, feeling safe. And so I um, wanted to think about what could we do with those objects. And from that, the What Would You Bring project was, brought, was born. Sorry, from that, the What Would You Bring project was born. Um, and we um, met some of the people who owned the objects and Aurora was one of the people, I found her teacup or was given her teacup to look at when I was in New York and she's still alive and living in New York. So I was put in touch with her and she told me her story and she shared her story and why she brought her teacups with her. And she shared what she couldn't bring with her. So she told me she couldn't bring books with her and she then shared the story of how she was helped um, to resettle and to make a really happy and successful life for herself in New York, where she still lives. And she volunteers at Evo now. Um, and it just struck me that um, the story that she told was similar to the story that I've been told about my grandparents and similar to the story that refugees that I'd sat down with were telling, was, were telling me. And really the objects there's something about the objects that we all can connect to so we all can connect to a cup and think about a cup that belonged to our grandparents or think about a toy that is really precious to us and and for me there was something about those objects make the stories and experiences of refugees something that is really so relevant to all of us today that's excellent um Anne marie it's interesting uh like many other types of initiatives that are out there, I think that what particularly stands out about the work that Juliet has been doing in collaboration with Reboot um, is really finding ways to amplify the narratives of refugees. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the work of UNHCR under your leadership, particularly from the vantage point of how you are amplifying the narratives of refugees and specifically empowering them to tell their own stories, not having others tell them for them. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this because I think that's a really important component of our work at USA for UNHCR mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, we're the national partner of UNHCR in the US to, to, to help with public awareness around refugee issues. Uh, and to raise resources for UNHCR's work and that of its implementing partners. But when I came to the position seven and a half years ago, I said in order to be relevant in the United States, we needed to tell the story of resettled refugees and the contributions that they make here in the United States. Um, they are contributors, they're not just people that have needs. Um, but in order to do that, it's not, it's not for us to tell that story. Uh, we really believed our role was to provide a platform by which resettled refugees could tell and shape 
their own stories, their own narrative. Um, so we use our platform to lift the voices of resettled refugees who have found safety here and a chance to rebuild their lives in the U.S. And I think amplifying the authentic voice of refugees who now call the U.S. home is a powerful way to raise awareness, to build empathy, and to connect the American public to the larger global refugee crisis. When you hear someone share their story, you can't help but find something to latch on to, something you can identify with. And I think that was the, the power of Aurora Zinder's story is we can all relate. Um, you may see a reflection of your own personal story and what was shared, and then you have a connection. You're a mom trying to provide the best for their children or a dad working hard to care for a growing family and his parents or a young person who's just discovering a passion and has an entire life before them. Um, we just think it's important that we keep sharing stories and lifting refugee voices so we never forget that the heart of every refugee crisis are individuals with hopes, dreams, and aspirations. There are 84 million people of concern for UNHCR, refugees, asylum seekers, um, internally displaced people. The stats and the numbers are huge, but I think we forget that those behind every number is an individual with a very powerful personal story. Um, I don't know anyone who can tell that story better than those people th themselves. And I think that's the unique role we play. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the things that I found really interesting is also those organizations with whom USA for UNHCR partners and supports, as you had educated me when we spoke previously, um, that there's a process by which uh, organizations get approved as refugee resettlement agencies. And I know one of the organizations with whom you work is Sloan's nonprofit, Hello Neighbor. So talk a little bit about what that relationship uh, looks like and how it's been to work with Sloan and her team. Sure. I think um, what happens in terms of the refugee process or people that are resettled to the U.S. is UNHCR makes the determination that their status as a refugee is authentic. And then the U.S. government goes through its own vetting process, which takes about two years, 21 different steps, three different uh, federal agencies uh, that really ensure that these people are legitimate. They are who they say they are. They are worthy of bringing to our country. They are then um, placed with nine, one of nine resettlement agencies. Um, many of them are faith-based. Faith um, so we have organizations such as the International Rescue Committee, IRC, which has a, a J Jewish history founded by Albert Einstein. Highest, uh, another Jewish agency. And then there are other faith-based agencies um, that along with um, non-faith-based agencies that help resettled refugees when they first arrive, largely for the first three months where they're provided with some federal support. Then it's individual communities and municipalities that really step up for resettled refugees. Organizations like uh, Sloan's organization, Hello Neighbor, we found it quite a catalytic approach, um, a new way of working uh, with resettled refugees. Initially, it started as a database that allowed Americans anywhere in the country to find out how they could volunteer or support refugees around 2015, if I'm correct, Sloan. And uh, we just started talking. We were introduced by Susan McPherson, and we felt that the work that Sloan was doing in Pittsburgh was just so important, actually connecting resettled refugees with Pittsburgh citizens, families, um, community groups. Uh, we just found it uh, a, a fresh, innovative approach that really helped resettled refugees um, situate and assimilate into their community. So it's been a great pleasure to work with Sloan um, over the last few years and to see the organization grow both in influence and the number of refugees it's been able to assist. Well, Sloan, it's always lovely when other people talk so passionately <laughs> and enthusiastically about you. And uh, it is such a pleasure to have you with us today as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about what um, inspired you to create Hello Neighbor and a little bit more about the work that you do and why it's so important. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me here today, Anne-Marie, it's always lovely to share a space with you, Zoom room or in person. <laughs> um, so I 
when I learned about the refugee resettlement process, what I was really struck by is that the majority of support happens within the first 90 days. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree your first three months doing anything new is a whirlwind. And if you add on the experience for refugees living through trauma, carrying that with them, having language access and cultural barriers, the idea that at three months they had to be fully self-sufficient just seemed overwhelming to me. And when I asked resettlement agencies and other folks in the space, well, what happens next? What happens at the 91st day? Um, you know, traditionally what I would hear is that, you know, the way that the federal government has set up the refugee resettlement process since a bipartisan act that passed in 1980, really formalizing how our country does refugee resettlement, is that's really how it works. We're based on that first three months, the case managers, which are the hardest working people in the world and the most caring, but they roll off that case and they roll on to new cases. That's really the way the system was built. So there wasn't really a lot out there in what I call, you know, post resettlement space. And so in 2017, as I was um, getting to know refugees and immigrants here in my hometown of Pittsburgh, first volunteering and then working part time at a refugee resettlement agency. I have international development and nonprofit experience. I really saw this opportunity to not try and duplicate the services or step in to where resettlement agencies operate, but to come in as a continuation service and to find a way to help bridge the gap, to bring in caring neighbors to help guide and support their newest neighbors in their new journey. And that was really how Hello Neighbor was first, first started. So Sloan, uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the kind of work that the Jewish community in Pittsburgh does that contributes to the work of supporting refugees. Absolutely. So I can say as a native of Squirrel Hill, and I also grew up three blocks from Tree of Life, we have seen in Pittsburgh, and I actually still live very close by to Tree of Life, and I drive by it almost every day. So the unfortunate terrorist attack that happened here, I think really highlighted um, the work of the Jewish community and how consistent, constant, and um, uh how consistent that uh, how constant and consistent the Jewish community has been here in Pittsburgh supporting refugees that that's really the root uh, of so much that we see um, and also we're in the neighborhood of Mr. Rogers. So I think that Pittsburgh in general does a lot of work thinking about what it takes to build a welcoming and inclusive community. I like to say that if you really love something, you can want it to be better at the same time. So I think we can recognize, you know, that we are not a nation of immigrants. We are a nation of people who forcibly displaced those who were here. We are a nation that brought enslaved people here. And then after those recognitions, we can say, yes, refugees and immigrants have also been here and come here to rebuild their lives from scratch. And I think that the, those in the Jewish faith, they know that incredibly well. And they've seen how um, hatred, violence, you know, targeted violence can really Im negatively impact their communities. And I also think they see how communities can come together. And so Pittsburgh, I, I think, you know, both fortunately and unfortunately is in the position to be in that light to, you know, to be looked at, what are we doing here to create that welcoming and inclusive community? And I can say that, you know, we have the support of our elected officials, we have the support of our interfaith community. I mean, Hello Neighbor has been in a really, you know, unique position in that we, we've received a lot of support regardless of who's in office, you know? And I also really like to say that part of when I talk about Hello Neighbor to refugees here in the region, I like to say, you know, don't worry about what's happening in Washington, DC. Don't worry about what you see on the news. Hello Neighbor is here, we're not going anywhere. You know, we are here for you. And I think that that sense of community cohesion also really does speak to the Jewish faith. That's a sense of community. That's a sense of belonging. You know, that's a sense of you do unto others as you know you would wish done unto yourself. And I think it's also the very real reality that people are forced to flee their homes and to rebuild their lives from scratch and to recognize that it could really happen to any of us in just a moment's notice. Excellent. Thank you for that additional context. Um, Anne-Marie, uh, 
you know, as I said at the start of our conversation today, certainly one of the urgent refugee crises that is in the news right now uh, in, relates to the situation going on in Ukraine. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, USA for UNHCR's work in terms of how Ukrainian refugees who will inevitably be coming to the United States uh, will get uh, integrated into our country and more specifically, just talk a little bit about how you guys are navigating that situation, as well as other situations that perhaps are not getting as much exposure in the news media. Sure, I think as everyone has seen in the news coverage over the past two months, um, the war in Ukraine has triggered the fastest growing displacement since World War II. I mean, this is an exodus. We have not seen anything as large or move so fast. We're talking about more than 12 million people who've been forced to flee violence in Ukraine since the end of February. More than 5 million are refugees who have fled into neighboring countries like Poland, Romania, Moldova, Moldova and Hungary, as well as the Czech Republic. And we're now seeing them move from there into Germany, France, and the UK. Um, more than 5 million are refugees. Nine 90% are women and children. This is a staggering figure. While women and children are disproportionately the majority of those forced to flee, we 90% is, is absolutely staggering. And, and that brings with it additional challenges for organizations such as UNHCR and other groups that are assisting with this crisis. Another 7.7 .7 million are internally displaced inside Ukraine. Um, that means they fled their home but have not crossed a border. And I think what we often forget is there were 6 million, close to 6 million refugees who had resettled from places like Syria um, to the Ukraine that have also had to flee, meaning they've had to seek refuge twice. Another 13 million more people are estimated to be stranded in affected areas and unable to leave due to security risks. So the needs at the moment are enormous and unprecedented. It's been much easier to deliver protection, shelter, aid, uh, and distribute essential items in, in the countries that have been receiving refugees from Ukraine than it has been to deliver humanitarian assistance within Ukraine, because that is a live war zone. Um, our work is everything from psychosocial counseling, cash assistance, to the Refugees have some agency and dignity um, and can um, purchase what they need in the countries in which, in the communities in which they've uh, fled to. Um, we're providing shelter. We have a blue dot program that we're running with UNICEF that particularly is targeting um, women and unaccompanied children. Uh, we're providing, you know, assistance um, uh, as well as stockpile, you know, we've, we've reduced our stockpiles of emergency uh, core relief items as well. One of the biggest roles we have is working with governments at a national level, as well as a municipal level to ensure that these communities continue to welcome and accept those that are, have been forced to flee. So it is a, it is unprecedented um, emergency for us. Uh, we have while we were working in Ukraine since 2014, we've had to go into surge capacity both within Ukraine and the countries that are now receiving um, those who have been forced to flee. Um, the needs are, are tremendous. Thank you for that. And certainly, you know, regardless of, of uh, whether it's a faith-based background or not, I think that the work of uh, individuals, everyone who is watching this program today, to find meaningful ways to contribute and support the efforts of both your organizations is incredibly important and something that we will certainly make sure to drive people and make them aware of the important work that you're doing and how they can be of assistance. Um, with regard to Juliet's project and the film that we saw today, I think one of the things that had particularly resonated for me when she brought it to Reboot and we first started to collaborate on it together was the fact that the objects are a um, entry point into the common experiences of people across borders, that you can have been a Holocaust survivor or come from the Ukraine or Afghanistan or South Sudan or anywhere where refugee crises are ongoing and incredibly 
harrowing uh, and maybe someone brought a teacup or a tea set or a book or a teddy bear. Um, Sloan, I know you have dealt with a significant number of refugee families over the last number of years. Uh, and I'm interested uh, to hear a little bit about the kinds of things, the items you have found that they have brought with them, if any particular thing stands out. Absolutely, yes. So, you know, I have been to countless airport pickups and, you know, probably interacted with 500 to 700 refugees over the last five years, been in many of those homes and sat on the floor and played with the children and, you know, drank coffee and tea and spent time with the families. The number one item I hear that people bring are wedding photos, either their own or photos of their parents, their wedding. But I frequently have had people sort of bring out and say, let us show you this, you know, really happy day that we had. Um, and it's really interesting to see what people are able to get versus what they're not able to get. You know, when, when we when we pick people up, you know, we say how many bags do you have because we're thinking how many cars do we need? You know, what, what do we have? And some people, you know, as a family of seven, they have seven bags, 13 bags, you know, and that's that's it. I mean, they're carrying everything with them um, in these huge duffels and that's what they have. So, you know, I've also seen a few children's toys like teddy bears. Um, but for the most part, people are, are able to take what they can carry. The majority mm -hmm. of refugees that qualify as refugees around the world, Anne Marie said this so well in terms of, you know, the, the women and children, we're not talking about people that got on an airplane and left early. No. We're not talking about people with disposable income to make other types of choices. We're talking about everyday people, the majority of, of whom would be, you know, low, low income or small business owners, shopkeepers, pharmacists, and they walk yeah. or they take a van or a pickup truck of some kind to a border. So, you know, these are not, you know, people who are, again, able to take a lot of stuff. That's a different status. And so I think really what we have to remember for refugees is it's what they can carry. And I think yeah. that speaks so well to this film, you know, like if you were forced to flee your home, um, what would be most important to you? In some cases, yes, it's those documents, but what else are your heirlooms or the things that are really meaningful to you that you can physically carry with you? Um, Juliet, as you are continuing um, to build out the storytelling platform and the personal narratives of refugees, um, both past and present, I know you had recently uncovered an interesting an anecdote about uh, an item that people bring with them that perhaps uh, those who are watching this today might not really have considered. And I'd love for you to sort of share a little bit about that because I found that so interesting. One of the items that I often hear that people bring with them are their keys, the keys for their own their homes in the countries that they're leaving, because no one, I think, wants to think that they're going to be a refugee forever, and everyone wants to think that they'll be able to go home. Um, and often people will tell me or used to tell me that they brought their keys with them or they still have their keys with them because mm -hmm. that home is really their the home that they grew up in or the home that they made into a home um, when they started a family. I'd love to add to that if I could. Please. Yeah, I think, you know, when we talk, and Sloan, you raised such an important point, when we talk about uh, the refugee crisis and resettled refugees um, are, are one category, but for most of the 41 plus emergencies that UNHCR has responded to, it is people without means who have all, often have 60 seconds to make a decision on what they're going to flee with. So I've seen keys. There's a wonderful poem, What They Took With Me by Jennifer Talksbit. And it's, it's just a wonderful reminder of like how important a simple piece of paper can be. A cell phone, an everyday object might be all they're able to take. When I've been in camps in Jordan, what I've seen is the most valuable possession is often the documentation papers. People will take great pride in unfolding, unfolding the, the copies that they have to prove who they are. That's all they've got. That's incredibly powerful. And I know that 
both the work that uh, USA for UNHCR supports, as well as the work that Allo Neighbor does, and the work that uh, Juliet is helping to amplify um, is incredibly uh, important in terms of empowering refugees to have the spaces in order to tell their own stories. As we're wrapping up, um, I'm, I'd love to go around to each of you and just have you share with people where they can find out more about your organizations and what specifically they can do to support you and the important work that you're doing on behalf of refugees. So Sloan, why don't we go ahead and start with you? And I'm gonna say something to close out if you end up cutting it. Please, <laughs> uh, no, it. absolutely, go for it. Um, I just want to say that there's so many ways that people can get involved. And for those that are watching this webinar and participating in this film and being part of Reboot Conversations, this is one critical pathway. You know, I always say there's a lot of ways you cross the threshold of an organization like Hello Neighbor or UNHCR, a digital threshold, a physical one, you know, but that all is part of what makes community and frequently I'll hear from people, oh, I haven't really thought that much about refugees before. Um, maybe they saw something in the news, maybe they met somebody in a workplace or you know, at a bus stop or a grocery store. But I say, well, you know, do you care about women and children? That's the majority of refugees. Do you care about your neighbors? Do you think about you know, what makes a strong community involve refugees and immigrants in that conversation. And I think we all could take a look around at those places we shop, we frequent, we visit, you know, that matter to us and take a moment to see maybe your eyes have scanned over the person that looks different from you, or maybe there's an opportunity, you know, to go up and say hello. That doesn't mean they're new. Someone could have been here for 20, 30, 40 years, but just, I think that self-awareness that, you know, it really is a, a fabric. It really is a quilt that makes up our communities. And even just participating in a, in a webinar and watching the film today is a great way to take an action. And I really think people should feel empowered for what they're able to do in the moment and not guilty for what they can't. You know, that's what makes, that's what it takes all of us, it takes all of us to make that difference. Um, in terms of ways to get involved with Hello Neighbor, so we have a couple of ways. Um, our website, helloneighbor.io, across social media, we're Hello Neighbor HQ. And you know, we tell a lot of storytelling on purpose to really bring some of that, you know, cultivating community and sense of belonging from no matter where people are, are learning about us. Our majority of programs are in the Pittsburgh region. So if anybody's watching from Pittsburgh, has family here, encourage you, you know, to become a mentor, or volunteer, get involved. But beyond that, we have wish lists online that people from all over the country and actually the world, you know, um, participate in. And then we also have a national project of which UNHCR is, is a funder. So thank you, called the Hello Neighbor Network. And that's where we bring together leaders that are working with refugees and immigrants all around the country. We currently have a hundred members in 40 states. So no matter where you are watching this from, I would like to bet that someone in the Hello Neighbor Network is in your local community. And so there's a lot of ways to find that local organization. And if we can be of help, please reach out. I'm happy to do it. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, Anne-Marie, tell us a little bit about how people can find out more about the work of USA for UNHCR and sure. uh, support you. That's thank you for that. And I think really it's about how you can support the refugee cause. So volunteering to organizations such as Hello Neighbor, finding out how at a community level or an or a state level or a national level you can get involved is a great way. Having conversations like this, I absolutely echo that and have the conversations, not with people that think just like us, that recognize and support refugees, but be willing to instigate those conversations with others who, who might not be convinced. Um, I say to my staff, you know, we all have a responsibility to be kind, to be tolerant, to welcome the difference in our communities, as well as the things that bring us together. Advocate, be part of a global community who stand up with refugees, write to your representatives, congratulate those that are acting in ways and, and funding in ways that you think is supportive, critique those that aren't. <laughs> um, welcome those that are newly um, newly arrived in our country. Um, they need your support. It's a long journey to safety. And that's only the first step of the journey. They truly, really need your support when they come, not only that first three months, but ongoing. Um, connect. We 
we all have a responsibility to understand and to have a greater sense of, of belonging and to, to create that in the communities in which we live. And then donate, donate to organizations such as Hello Neighbor, to USA for UNHCR, to those that are supporting the refugees and resettled refugees in your community. Thank you. Standing. So thank you so much. And then lastly, Juliet, I know you've been in the process of building a really exciting repository of refugee stories and that work continues. I'd love uh, for you to tell people where they can find out more about the work of what would you bring? I would just also like to say that um, an echo what Anne-Marie and Sloan have said about connecting with people. And for me, part of that is knowing your own story and knowing your family's story. And by knowing your own story and sharing your family's story with refugees, you can make people feel connected and make them realise that their experiences are things that you understand or that your family understands. Um, and I think that's really important. And you can do that through our project, through What Would You Bring, through the What Would You Bring website. Um, there are a, a toolkit that you can use that allows people to think about what their story is, to discuss it with their children, with their families, with their friends. Um, it's a suitcase, you can draw in it, you can stick pictures in it, um, you can then share it with us, you can share it, take it to the refugees and the organisations that you're going to volunteer with and just show that actually we do all have things in common and that we are, you know, one community and that refugees become part of that community and add enormous value to it as well. well ladies, thank you so much. This has absolutely been a great pleasure. We're really thankful for your time and the important work that each of you are doing. Uh, and I would also like to thank the folks um, behind Jewish American Heritage Month, Michael Glickman, the CEO of JMUSE, the Weitzman National Museum of American Jewish History, the fine folks at Reboot, including Executive Director David Katz Nelson and Chief Network Officer Francine Hermelin, the amazing Susan McPherson, and of course, uh, this incredible panel today, Juliet Simmons, founder of the What Would You Bring Project, Anne Marie Gray, CEO of USA for UNHCR, and Sloan Davidson, the founder and CEO of Hello Neighbor. Ladies, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye, everyone.